Welcome to my review for The Mystery of the Mary Celeste, which came out in 1935, which makes it by far the oldest film I have ever reviewed on this channel, beating the previous record of The Quatermass Experiment from 1955. It's absolutely smashed that record. So why is it then that I have suddenly decided to jump so far into the past? Well, two reasons. Firstly, I like to do a Hammer film every few weeks, and this is a Hammer Studios film, believe it or not. Secondly, it crossed my mind that seeing as I've been doing all these other Hammer films, wouldn't it be cool to go right back to the very beginning one day and review the very first Hammer film? So that's what I've done. I can't actually watch or review the first Hammer film though because it no longer exists. It's a film called The Public Life of Henry VIII and it's been lost to time. It just wasn't preserved properly so nobody can watch it anymore. Maybe it's the greatest film ever and nobody knows. It's almost unimaginable these days to think that a film could just go missing, but that's apparently what happened with this film. I mean, can you imagine if somebody put out a public statement today saying, everybody, I'm afraid we've lost the original negatives to Terminator 1, so once all the current Blu-rays out in circulation get scratched, I'm afraid there's going to be no more Terminator 1. I'm really sorry, it's my fault. I left the negative lying around on the side, the cat got it, my bad. Now, it just wouldn't happen with any film anymore. So I had to turn my attentions to the second film which Hammer brought out, a film called The Mystery of the Mary Celeste, and instantly the title grabbed me. Now, this film is described as a mystery film on Wikipedia, but having now seen it, I can tell you it is every bit a horror film. If you're not familiar with the legend of the Mary Celeste, because this is based on a real-life story, basically in the 19th century, a clipper ship left New York carrying trade across the Atlantic Ocean. It didn't go missing completely. Another ship following more or less the same sort of path came across the Mary Celeste, but when it got up close to it, it realized that there was nobody on board. Everybody involved with that ship had gone missing. The life raft was missing from the ship, so possibly two or three people managed to escape and go off somewhere, but they were never discovered, so they must have perished at sea. Not everybody on the Mary Celeste, though, could have fit onto this life raft, so why were there no bodies on board? And people have tried to offer up various theories as to what actually happened. Maybe it was pirates, maybe it was some kind of sea creature, maybe it was something supernatural, or maybe it was just infighting. Maybe maybe somebody just went berserk on the ship and started offing any, everybody, but if that's the case, where are the bodies? Unless they threw them overboard or something. So this film attempts to tell a fictionized version of what happened on the Mary Celeste. And I can tell you right now, it has gone for the idea that at least one person went crazy and started offing everybody. I think that was a sensible move. I'm not sure that 1930s cinema could have done a Kraken very convincingly. So here we are, that is the plot, and I will also tell you that everything I've just told you about the Mary Celeste didn't come from my own extensive knowledge. Before I watched this film, I decided to watch a 25-minute documentary about the Mary Celeste on YouTube because I sort of wanted to get a bit of background information before I watched the actual movie. Once I was done, that was when I watched the movie itself on YouTube. Yes, you can watch this for free on YouTube. You don't have to go out and buy a Blu-ray or anything. It is in the public domain. Curiously, though, even though this film isn't lost like the Henry VIII film is lost, 18 minutes of it is lost. So you can only watch a 62-minute version of this film Originally it was 80 minutes, but for some reason 18 minutes at some point was lost. The good news is it's not like you can watch an hour of the movie and then, oh sorry, there's no more. You, you don't get to find out what happened at the end or in reverse. It's not like you pick up at a certain point and then watch the rest of the movie. It's not like that. So when this film came out, apparently they made two versions for the various international markets. One was 80 minutes, one was 62 minutes. The 80 minute version somehow got lost. It just wasn't preserved properly. We do still have the 62 minute version and it is free and available on YouTube. And I can say it is at least watchable. They have spliced together a version which does work. I will say that if you don't watch an awful lot of old movies, your brain may take some time to adjust to how ancient this film feels and how old it sounds. The dialogue is just about clear in terms of being able to hear it, but there were times in this where I struggled to hear the odd mumbled sentence and 
They do use a bit of seafarer jargon from time to time. I say this as somebody who has watched a lot of films from the 50s over the past couple of years. I definitely noticed a big gap in quality though between 50s mo movies and this movie from the 30s. If you're the type of person who's never watched a film earlier than say Halloween from 1978, then you're gonna be in a world of hurt and you, you might be tempted to reach for the remote after a few minutes of this and turn it off. I implore you not to. I would at least commit to the full hour and give it a chance because it is a pretty decent movie for its day. I mean, I watched Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings the other week with its £250 million budget and I've got to say, I enjoyed this movie more. I watched it with my son on a Saturday afternoon and there were times when we didn't always understand what was going on. I don't know if that's because some of the film is, is missing at various points, but yeah, we were asking each other questions constantly about things we didn't understand. There's a moment where a character just randomly climbs up some rigging and jumps into the water down below, seemingly for no reason at all. Screen transitions was something they clearly hadn't figured out back in the 1930s either. It's a little bit awkward when we go from one scene to another. But there are also a lot of things that happen throughout the movie which suddenly impressed me that I didn't expect. Sound effects are very good. I don't mean the dialogue, I mean sort of the, the sounds of the, the sea and the ship creaking and the sound of the storms that happen during the film. That part of the sound design is very, very competent in this. There's, going back to that storm scene, the ship is sort of moving like this and the characters are getting wet and it genuinely does feel like they're in the middle of a storm even though i'm guessing for that particular scene they weren't actually on a boat for some of the other parts of the movie they clearly were on a boat and i was very impressed about that because i watched the damned from the early 60s and there were plenty of times in that movie where they were clearly using a fake background for scenes set at sea but in this movie for most of it, I was utterly convinced that we, we were actually at sea. I thought it was going to be a case of using those kind of curly backboards that you see during school plays, you know, with somebody holding them up, that, that kind of deal. But no, there's nothing like that. I was very impressed. The plot is fun because throughout the movie, we're constantly trying to figure out, as the audience, who the killer is. We're given a strong clue at the start as to who it's going to be, but I was never quite convinced that it was him. And it sort of implied near the end that there were possibly two killers uh, with completely different agendas. And the film does a very good job of hiding who is actually offing everybody on the ship. So it, it's certainly a film which never gets boring. Bella Lugosi's in the film. I didn't expect to recognize any of the actors in this with it being such an old film. But yeah, Bella Lugosi's in there, he of Dracula fame. I'm going to say something really embarrassing now. I've still never seen any of the old Universal Monsters films, even though I'm now in my 40s. I know, it's, it's on my bucket list. I've not got around, gotten around to it yet. I'm going to. So this was my first experience of Bella Lugosi, and he's comfortably the best actor in the film. He's playing a sailor who had some kind of traumatic experience before his journey on the Mary Celeste. So this character is not having a very lucky time of it, but he wears all these pained expressions on his face throughout the film, and they're all very convincing. He's not the main character, this guy who Bella Lugosi's playing. I said that Benjamin Briggs, the skipper, and his wife are the two main characters. Sarah Briggs, the woman, she's the only woman in the film, and she's your typical old school damsel in distress. She spends the entire runtime pretty much down in the nice warm cabin, whereas all the men are outside doing all the heavy lifting and dealing with the storms and stuff. I mean, it's, she's not a bad character. She's pretty well acted, to be fair. There's a crazy scene where one of the sailors comes down to try and rape Sarah whilst all the men are busy with the storm. That, that's his reasoning for how he's going to get away with it. He actually says to Sarah while he's grappling with her, they'll be with that storm for a while while I do my thing. And I'm thinking, this is a stupid plan. It is absolutely not going to work. Even if it did, Sarah could just tell the other men what happened and you'd be in a world of hurt anyway. But as it happens, he doesn't even get a shred of her clothing off before one of the, the other men comes down and this guy gets killed for his troubles. What an absolute clown. Sarah Briggs and her husband, Benjamin, they are clearly established as the two main characters in this film. And yet, about 20 minutes from the end, they just randomly disappear. It's really silly. So if we go back to the main legend of the Mary Celeste outside of this movie, some people clearly left that ship on a life raft. 
In this film, it's Benjamin Briggs and his wife, but we don't see it. We don't even see them discussing the possibility of getting on this life raft. And yet we cut to a scene where one of the characters is basically saying, oh, yeah, the, the skipper and his wife, they left on a life raft. And I'm thinking, well, we don't even get to see that. It's... And then I think it's also implied that they were possibly killed as they were es escaping on the life raft. It's so bizarre that we don't see this. It's really, re really weird. And the final scene on the ship as well. So one of the killers, uh, or he might be the only killer, I don't know at this point. Um, he's just finished bumping off the last of the people he, he, he intends to kill. So it's just him on his own now, left on the ship, seemingly. And then he gets hit by a bit of the ship that swings round and he falls to the deck, stands up as if he's really bumped his head and then he just jumps over the side of the ship into the middle of the ocean. We're nowhere near land. It's like, you know what? I'm going to be re-watching this film definitely because I need to figure out certain things that went on during it that I just do not have a clue about. It's so bizarre. So I guess it's time to move towards my summing up. And yes, I did enjoy this movie. I certainly laughed at it quite a lot, sometimes at the movie. Sometimes I was laughing at the very deliberate humour that is in there. But I liked it. My son liked it. Would I recommend it? Well, on the basis that it's free and it's no more than an hour long, then yes. And if you watch this film, you'll be able to say that you've seen the first ever Hammer horror film. So let's get to the Bag of Terror and find out how all this translates into a score. So we got one, two, two and a half bloody axes out of five. It's always difficult to give a score for old films. If I compare this to modern day horror films, I mean, I'm probably giving it a one or a one and a half. But if I put myself into somebody going to the cinema in 1935 to watch this, it was probably a, a really amazing experience, a really exciting one. And I might well have given it four out of five back in those days. So I think ultimately I've decided to sort of meet in the middle on this and go for two and a half. I think that's fair. It's an average horror film, I guess, but I kind of liked it and I, I would certainly watch it again. So there we have it. I don't think this is going to mean that I'm going to go on and watch loads of other Hammer films from the 30s and 40s. They didn't do an awful lot in those two decades, I don't think. So I think my next film after this is going to be back in the 1950s. I've got my eye on one particular film. I'm not going to reveal at this stage what it is, but I will certainly be back to do it very soon, I hope. So until then, thanks for joining me and cheerio, bye-bye.